What does the cross mean to you? We have a cross in the front of our worship center. We have a cross out by our sign. Here's a little cross that Vivian and I have in our home. We got this in Belize. We went to the Mayan ruins. And as we were walking out, they were selling these crosses. And I thought, now isn't that interesting? The cross. What does it really represent? Some people wear a cross around their neck. The cross seems to be pretty popular. The Pope wears the cross. Rock stars wear crosses. When I went into Rite Aid this past week in Warrington, there was a whole rack of crosses, metal crosses. You could buy a cross and wear a cross around your neck. What does the cross mean to you and to me? Strength, love, forgiveness, sacrifice. The cross means a lot. Yes, life over death. When I think about the cross, I think about two things in particular. My lost condition, and I'm applying this personally to me, my lost condition before God. In other words, my sin has separated me from a holy God. So the cross is a reminder of my previous condition before coming to Jesus Christ. I was lost in my sin. The cross also reveals the love, the supreme love of God. The price that God was willing to pay so that I might be forgiven of my sin, that I might be reconciled to God by faith. In other words, restored into a right relationship forever. See, the cross was a cursed manner of death. The scripture says in the Old Testament, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. And the cross represents a tree on which Jesus, the very Son of God, God himself, hung and died so that the sin barrier could be broken. The barrier between a holy God and an unholy person like myself. And all of humanity is in that category, whether we want to recognize it or not. We're all lost. We're all helpless and hopeless apart from the love and mercy and grace of God. You see, the cross reminds us that God came down to us. Why? Because we could not come up to Him. It was the only means by which we could be saved and have life everlasting. Now, who killed Jesus? I have a little outline in your bulletin there, and I ask that question. Who killed Jesus? There's been a lot of debate about that, all of us. That, that's one possibility. Did I kill Jesus? Did my sin kill Jesus? What about those Jewish leaders? Didn't they petition Pilate? Aren't they the ones who are responsible for killing Jesus? But now wait a minute, what about the crowd who cried out, crucify him, crucify him? Wasn't it the Jews who killed Jesus? Or, wait a minute now, think about this a little deeper. How about Pilate? See, Pilate had the power whether to put a person to death or not. He was the ruler there. Maybe we should blame Pilate. He's the one who said, okay, I'm going to hand him over to you. I'm going to wash my hands of him. You go ahead and do what you want. Go ahead and crucify him. He gave the permission. Wasn't it Pilate? Who crucified Jesus? So, so now who was it? The Jews or, or Pilate or me? or No, it was the Roman soldiers. Who put the spikes through his hands? Now come on, we all know it was the Roman soldiers. I think they're the ones who killed Jesus. Well, you know what? It's none of the above. You realize that? None of the above. God killed Jesus. God killed Jesus. I want us to just listen to a couple scriptures that I wrote down about this important matter of 
who killed Jesus because it, it's been a debate for a long, long time and people have gone round and round and round about who really killed Jesus. Well, you know, the apostle Peter kind of cleared the record. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23, this was after Pentecost when Peter was speaking to the whole big group there. He said, Jesus was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. In other words, it was God's plan from the beginning to rescue lost humanity by himself, by giving himself in death to redeem us. Now, Peter goes on to, or, or excuse me, the believers, when they prayed in Acts chapter 4, verse 28, uh, they said, Lord, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. In other words, they were saying it was God's sovereign plan that he die so that we might live. And then if we go way back into the Old Testament to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, which we know talks about the Messiah, here we see that, that uh, the Holy Spirit inspired the prophet Isaiah to write these words. And the Lord, L-O-R-D, that's Almighty God, the Lord has laid on him, that's the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. In other words, the sin of the world would be put upon the Messiah, the Christ, the Redeemer of lost mankind. And then Isaiah says in, in verse 10 of chapter 53, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. The Lord makes his life a guilt offering. A guilt offering. God would be the sacrifice for the sin of lost humanity. And as we said, as we partook of communion, for God so loved the world that he gave. See, the cross reminds us of the love of God for lost humanity. Now take your Bibles and let's go to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, because here we see Jesus on the cross. In the, in the next number of weeks, we're going to focus on Jesus on the cross and his last words from the cross. His last words reveal his character. We can't pass these by. We've got to recognize the significance of these words of Jesus as he was dying, giving himself for our sin. So Luke chapter 23, and look with me at verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, now this is significant, don't miss this, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the King of the Jews. So we go back to the first statement of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them. And as I have on your outline, it reveals the very heart of God. You see, God's heart is mercy. And when Jesus prayed for those who were doing this terrible thing to him, he was saying, Father, in your mercy, 
do not hold this sin against them. See, the heart of God is revealed in Jesus Christ as he hung on that cross, bleeding, bruised, scorned, mocked. What better way could Jesus, the Son of God, show the love of God than to pray for those who were doing what they were doing to him? Some of you have seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ. It came out about 10 years ago. This coming Thursday, the movie, The Son of God, is going to be showing across our nation. Part of that presentation will be the crucifixion scene. You will again see the brutality of a person being crucified. Now we have to remember, church, this was not just a person like you or like me being crucified. This was God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God. He's part of the Godhead. He's part of what we call the Trinity, the triunity of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is God being treated in such a manner. Can you fathom that? I can't really fathom what Jesus went through as God and man when he was being crucified. And yet in that state of brutality, he prayed. The first words from his lips were a prayer to the Father. Father, forgive them. Was Jesus sincere? Was Jesus genuine when he prayed that prayer? Of course he was. We know that to be true. Jesus showed that he truly was God. Now, forgiveness sounds like such a marvelous idea until you are the one that has to do it, right? Any of you been hurt? Any of you been cheated, offended, bruised, beaten, whatever? We've all been mistreated in some way. We've all had to face the reality. When people treat us wrong, how are we going to respond? See, it's not just a physical matter, church. It's a spiritual matter. That's what Jesus reveals from the cross as we go to the Gospel of Luke here today. And, and we say to ourselves, how can I forgive somebody who, who, who hurts me and breaks their promise over and over again? H how can I forgive somebody who doesn't even ask me to forgive them? You see, those religious leaders... Those Roman soldiers, those Jews, they didn't ask Jesus to forgive them, but he said, Father, forgive them. How are we to do that when people treat us in that manner? And, and how should we forgive the one who has treated us so wrong and has caused so much pain in our life? Pain that has gone deep. Well, when we look at Jesus, we see how we are to respond by the mercy of God. You see, Jesus was facing his greatest trial when he hung on the cross. He was a victim of history's greatest crime that has ever been committed, a crime against God himself. But Jesus revealed the way of true freedom, and that is the way of forgiveness. Jesus chose to forgive those who were crucifying him and who had shouted, crucify him. Jesus chose by an act of his will. You know, he could have remained silent. He didn't have to pray to the Father, Father, forgive them. He could have been still. But he chose to express what was in his heart. It was a decision that was genuine. Now, as we read about this crowd, it says they sneered at him and they said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, if he is the chosen one. And the soldiers joined right in. They just mocked right along with the rest. And said, yeah, what a, what a fool. Look at that guy up there. Claims to be God, but he's helpless. 
Well, that wasn't true at all, was it? In fact, Jesus had said, I can call 12 legions of angels and they'll destroy the world. Now, that's 72,000. Actually, Jesus needed one angel. That, that would have been enough and could have wiped them all out right there. All the angels were waiting at Jesus beckoning to come and destroy humanity. And they could have done that. See, that's the power of Almighty God, and Jesus had that power. But Jesus instead chose to pray instead of to curse. Now that creates a scenario for us to reflect upon. When we face difficult situations where people have hurt us and, and abused us, what will be our response? What has been our response? I've encountered people that have held on to unforgiveness for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Some people all their life, they were abused as a child and they hated their father, they hated their mother, they hated that teacher, they hated that neighbor, they hated that person that did such an awful thing in abusing them. And that hate remained in their heart as they grew older and older and older. Did they have freedom? No, they were bound up. They were the slave. You see, unforgiveness does that. It, it, it binds us up. It, 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 it enslaves us. And we become the ones who suffer the most. That person probably has died or moved away or whatever. But we remain in the pit of pain when we choose not to forgive. Jesus set an example for us. But now you're saying to me, Pastor Pete, that was Jesus. He was God. He could do that. I I'm a human person. I've been wronged and I can't let go of it. I, I just can't forgive. Well, do we know anybody in the Bible who was just like us who did choose to forgive? Well, do you recall the first Christian martyr? His name is Stephen. Do you recall when he gave testimony concerning the truth of God that the people picked up stones and they stoned him to death? One stone at a time. I'm sure the first stone hurt, the second stone hurt, the third stone hurt, and, and, and pretty soon they were just throwing those stones one after another. And he was soon to die from those stones being hurled at him. Well, we're told in Acts chapter 7 that while Stephen was kneeling down, looking up into heaven, being stoned to death, he prayed a prayer. It's a prayer that's almost identical to the pray, prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross. Here's the prayer. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. In other words, Lord, forgive them for what they're doing. They know not what they're doing. Oh, they knew full well what they were doing. They were throwing rocks because they were calling Stephen a blasphemer. Blasphemer, just like they accused Jesus of blaspheming, calling himself to be God, calling himself to be a servant of God. They knew full well what they were doing, but they didn't really know who they were doing it to. And Stephen prayed for them. I believe that was the power of the Holy Spirit in Stephen that allowed him to do what Jesus did, to pray for those who were killing him. Wow. Can we do the same? Can we pray for people who have hurt us so deeply? Can we pray that God would forgive them? You see, my friends, there are those who have cheated us, slandered us, falsely accused us, humiliated us. They've taken advantage of us. They've done all kind of detestable things against us. We've all been hurt. But unless we forgive them from our heart, we will not be released from them. And the sin of unforgiveness continues to, it continues to hinder our relationship with the Lord himself. Jesus said, we must forgive. 
Paul said it very clearly in Colossians chapter 3. I have the scripture there on your, on your outline. Colossians 3, Paul says, we're to forgive just as Jesus has forgiven us. Now when I look at the cross, I think of all the sin of Pete Batches. And I think of how much I continue to sin and how much I continue to need the mercy of God. Now if I want my sins forgiven, what I'm told is I must forgive. I must choose by an act of my will. Will I feel like forgiving? No. But by faith in God and by an act of my will, I must choose to let go of that person and that pain and turn it over to God. I must be willing to let God vindicate me, vindicate me instead of my trying to get revenge or get even or get back because it will only destroy me. And how many people hasn't it destroyed? Unforgiveness. How many times has Jesus forgiven you? I've lost count. But I tell you what, that's the walk of the Christ follower. To forgive as we've been forgiven from the heart, no matter how bad it was. And then Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Have any of you had to do that? Or am I the only one here that's had to do that? See, there's a lot of people I've had to forgive over the years. People that I thought were standing with me and they ended up betraying me. And the pain went deep. And the Holy Spirit said, Pete, let go of them. Let God do his work. You pray for them. You bless them because they need God's mercy just like you need God's mercy. You see, the lesson is clear from Jesus. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Now Paul says in Romans chapter 12, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. It, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Paul had been beaten. He had been stoned to death. He had been mistreated. He had been betrayed. He had been cursed. He was a man just like you and me. By the grace of God, he chose to forgive. And if he had not chosen to forgive, I don't believe we would have the record of his testimony in God's word today. He walked in the steps of Jesus. And don't forget this. Paul was there when Stephen was being stoned to death. He was keeping the coats of those who were picking up the stones and hurling them at Stephen to kill him. Paul, it says in the scripture, consented to his death. In other words, he took part just as much as those who threw the stones. You see, Paul also learned the lesson of true freedom by forgiveness. I want to share the story of a woman that I met in the church that Vivian and I just recently served back in North Bend. Her name was Ada Wolf. I don't think any of you have ever met Ada. But when I met Ada, we began to get to know her. We had coffee at her house. We found out something very special about Ada. Ada's son had been murdered. It was Christmas Eve. He was working in a convenience store, and a robber came in and held up the store, and when he took all the money, he shot Ada's son to death. He was a murderer, and he fled. Well, the police caught him. He was convicted, sentenced to prison. Here's a mother, Christmas Eve, gets the news that her son has been murdered. Maybe you can put yourself there for just a moment. Maybe you can 
imagine some of the emotions that Ada Wolf felt when she got the news, when she heard what took place, that her son was now dead because of someone who needed a little money. Instead of just taking it and running, he chose to also kill her boy. Ada has a, had a choice, didn't she? She had a choice whether to hold on to that pain and hurt and unforgiveness towards that murderer. But she had another choice. She had a choice to forgive the man who killed her son. By the grace of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Ada chose to forgive him. She didn't just pray, Lord, forgive him and have mercy on his soul. Ada did what Jesus asked her to do. Because forgiveness, I believe, goes beyond just praying, Lord, forgive them. If it's possible, forgiveness goes into action to reach out in love. Just as God has reached out to us in love. Ada made an appointment to go to the prison where her son's murderer was behind bars. She got permission. He was told who was coming, the mother of the man he killed. And she went into that prison cell, and there Ada told him to his face, I have forgiven you, and God's forgiveness is for you through Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross so that you might be forgiven of your sin and have eternal life. But it's your choice whether to accept Jesus or not. Now, I don't know how many times Ada went back, but this young man humbled himself before God. And through the witness of the mother of the man that he murdered, she came to faith in Jesus Christ. He came to faith in Jesus Christ through her testimony, through her witness of love, genuine forgiveness from the heart. He came to faith in Jesus Christ, began reading the Bible, began sharing with others his newfound freedom, even though he was behind bars and would be the rest of his life. Now, Ada could have stopped there and said, okay, Jesus, I've done my part. That's enough. That, it's over now. And the Holy Spirit said, no, you go back to that young man and you ask him if he would be your partner in ministry. And together, if, you would, if he would be willing to serve with you in that prison, that you can share the love of Jesus with all of those who need forgiveness. And she did that. And she said, would you be my partner in ministry? And just two by two, we will go. We'll go together and we'll share the good news of Jesus with everyone who wants to hear. And he agreed. And that became their ministry. Ada and her son's murderer teamed up as partners for Jesus Christ in the gospel. And they began reaching out to the other inmates in that prison. What a delight to have someone like Ada sitting in that congregation. What an inspiration to me. What a reminder to me when people said bad things and did bad things and, and whatever else they did, that I could remember how Ada was able to forgive her son's murderer and then be a partner in ministry and do what would glorify God. You see, the end of the story is God used them both out of this tragedy, God turned it around to reach out to people in need. I want to close today by having us just look at something that's so very familiar to us. We know it as the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus taught his followers to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Did I miss anything there? I missed something very significant, didn't I? Because Jesus also taught his followers, of which I'm 
a follower, to pray, forgive us our debts or our sins or our trespasses, whatever translation you may have. Forgive us our debts as we also have what? Forgiven our debtors. Was, Je- was Jesus serious about this when he told his disciples, this is how you're to pray to the Father? Forgive me my sin, Lord, as I forgive those who sin against me. Well, just to make sure that the disciples didn't miss this point, because this is one of the most serious matters that we have to deal with before God. It's one of the deepest spiritual issues that we must deal with if we're to be in the will of God. See, Jesus said then at the end of that model prayer, for if, here's the choice part, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I don't know how you read that, but it can't get too much clearer. If I'm unwilling to forgive anyone, and it could be my father who's now dead 25 years. It could be a teacher who tried to abuse me when I was in eighth grade. And that was a long, long time ago. If I refuse to forgive anyone, Jesus is saying then, your father will not forgive your sins either, Pete. Do you see how serious this is, church? I don't know if there's anyone here who's holding on to unforgiveness. Because I can't read your mind. I, I don't have a clue, but God does know. He does see all. And I believe today is a day in which we are to come to Jesus and forgive that person or persons from our heart because God has forgiven us fully and completely by His sacrifice. This is to be a day of freedom for people who've held on to forgiveness. It may be one day. Somebody may have hurt you just yesterday. But it must be an act of your will that you bring them to God and turn them over to God and forgive them and say, now God, I know my feelings aren't there, but in faith, I'm going to do it because you've forgiven me. And then help me to do like Ada. Help me to do what will honor you. Let's just bow in prayer right here, right now, church. Let's get honest with the Lord, because otherwise our worship is a waste. If we're not willing to be honest and truthful before God who knows all, then we're only living in self-denial and deceit. Heavenly Father, right here, right now, we want to thank you that even though it cost Jesus, your son, his very life, you were willing to send him forth on our behalf. Jesus, we thank you that you were obedient to the Father and that you gave yourself completely as the Son of God, that you did not call those angels to destroy the world, but instead you prayed for those who abused you so terribly to be forgiven. Holy Spirit, we thank you for revealing the truth of God from the Word of God to us here today. Now, Holy Spirit, we want to ask your help to do what will honor the Lord, to forgive anyone who has wronged us that we've been holding on with unforgiveness. And that unforgiveness has been pulling us down and hindering us from our walk with the Lord. It's been destroying us inwardly, but it's also affected us outwardly. Holy Spirit, would you bring to mind anyone that we have not forgiven? And in the name of Jesus, right now we pray, Lord Jesus, in your name and by your power, I forgive And church, you go ahead and you name that person or persons. You just bring them to the throne of God and you leave them with the Lord. You entrust them to God. Even though they're dead and gone, 
Let them go right here, right now. Let this be a day of freedom and victory through the power of Jesus Christ and full forgiveness to walk in the light of God. Jesus, right now, we're just going to bring those people to you and pray from our heart, Father, forgive them. I forgive them. And I let go of the pain and hurt that they brought into my life that I may be a testimony of God's grace and mercy to me and share this with others. Now, Holy Spirit, in the coming days, we just give you permission to show us if there's anyone else that we need to bring to the throne of God and forgive from our heart and pray a blessing over them or even reach out in love to them as the Holy Spirit leads. We want to be fully devoted followers of God and not let any sin, any unforgiveness hold us back. We want to claim the victory that Jesus provided when he died and rose again triumphantly. It's in Christ our Savior's name we pray this. And let all God's people say, Amen, amen and Amen.